please give a warm welcome for Ellie Johnson as we go through the En-ROADS Climate Simulator together. Okay, so uh, thank you all for coming. Thanks South by Southwest for having us. Um, as Ben alluded to, uh, we're gonna need input for, from you for this session. There's been a lot of sessions this week, a lot of sitting, and I wanna get some feedback from the audience to inform where we go with these next minutes that we have. So uh, let's see, can you all get this QR code? Is tiny, does it work? If, if, if not, I'll go bigger. Uh, get some hands in the back. If your phone isn't reading this, let's, let's get bigger. All right, we'll go bigger, we'll go bigger. That's uh, pretty small. All right, let's try this. All right, try that. <laughs> okay, this is gonna pull up uh, a web page called Poll Everywhere, and I'm gonna ask you all to provide some input into that. So um, pull that up. See most phones down. I'll give you one second. If not, you can also text. Text to, uh, and so first off, just a survey of who we have in the room here. How important is climate change to you personally? And we see the numbers coming in. Extremely important is that green wedge there. Uh, very important is that blue wedge. And then we have smaller wedges, somewhat important, not too important, and not at all important. <laughs> and we, <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> if anyone votes A on purpose, we will find you. <laughs> I, I show this to you all just to give you a sense of who's in the room. Now, not all of us are Americans, but studies have been done on Americans and show consistently that we underestimate the amount of concern about climate change among our peers. So you might be sitting there worried about climate change, but if you were to assess who's in the room, you might make it lower than that, say, ah, oh, nobody else cares about this. And I think this is really important because it might inhibit us from talking about climate change with your Uber driver, your bartender, whomever, but the reality is, is that people are alarmed about this. And of course, yes, this is a self-selecting audience. You uh, opted into walking into this room called Climate Futures, but uh, uh, nonetheless, overwhelmingly, lots of concern about climate change here. Okay, next question. Um, all right, when you think about how we might make the biggest impact on climate change, Ben gave you some ideas if you uh, are new to this topic, but I imagine there's a lot of expertise in this room. What would you prioritize? You can pick one to three things. Uh, there's a whole list here. We're going to use this as the basis to build our global scenario for how to address climate change. All right, I'll give you all a minute to read through. If you didn't get the QR code, you can also text climate inter, I N T E R, 935 to 22333. And uh, you can submit it by letter. Um, but hopefully, but clearly, you all are figuring it out. Okay. Maybe it's because it's first on the list, maybe because it's uh, renewable energy. That one, 21% of you all are voting for that, with I see a number of other things rising in. So we have renewable energy at the top of our list, carbon price coming in uh, down later with 11% of the votes. Um, then we have reducing deforestation and forest degradation, electrifying transport, obviously a lot of discussion about that, discouraging coal, um, also uh, getting more than 5% of votes, nuclear in the mix there. All right, okay, That'll get, that gives us a good starting point. And next, somewhat out of curiosity, uh, but also because I think this can also inform our mental models in this room, is what actions to address climate change seem just overhyped to you all? Um, so let's get a mix, a mix of those, and maybe you will vote for both. You're like, well, we got to prioritize it, but it's so overhyped. And uh, just, uh, yeah, there's a quick, quick poll across the room. Um, and interestingly, also renewable energy, high on the list. Votes are coming in. Results are getting tallied quickly. Setting a carbon price also was high on our first uh, poll of priority actions. But also many of you all saying, eh, it's kind of overhyped, as well as 
electrifying transport. Interesting that this is somewhat similar to our first list, although I see a lot of votes coming in on that uh, last category there of promoting carbon dioxide removal. So carbon dioxide removal is this whole suite of different approaches. A lot of times we focus on stopping the emissions going into the atmosphere, but there's also how do we draw those carbon dioxide molecules out? And carbon dioxide removal is this flourishing space with tons of conversation, tons of startups, lots of moving and happening, and uh, what's going on there. The way we think about it at Climate Interactive is like a bathtub. So we all know how a bathtub works. It's just So think of our atmosphere like a bathtub where the inflow into your bathtub, so the faucet, is those emissions going in, going, on, going in and in. Carbon dioxide removal is the drain. How do we get those emissions out? How do we get that concentration of CO2 down? And so, like a bathtub, if your drain is clogged and your tap, your faucet is wide open, you're going to eventually overflow. That's where we see the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere rising and causing all of the resulting problems that we have. So how can we bring those things into balance? One way, turn off your faucet. Another, maybe figure out how to clean the drain. Okay, uh, this, this, is, this is really interesting. Okay, so our final results, a little less enthusiasm on encourage renewable energy in our overhyped category, but carbon price, electrifying transport, and carbon dioxide removal, definitely up there. Okay, at this point, I'm going to turn over to the En-ROADS Climate Solutions Simulator. So my team at Climate Interactive has built this with MIT Sloan's uh, sustainability initiative with input from people all over the world. As Ben said, we've used this in the halls of Congress. We've used this in C-suites uh, of Fortune 500 companies, small groups. It's been published in uh, multiple major media outlets. And over 300,000 people around the world have participated in events just like this. Some of them led by people like me and Ben, and others led by people who have gone through training to just become facilitators. So if you are not from the US or different corners of the US, uh, we probably have a facilitator or somebody in your area who is experienced in running events like this. And we, we go to different companies, help them run different scenarios, a whole variety of different actions. What we are looking at here is the baseline scenario of En-ROADS. So on the left, you see our energy mix. Coal at the bottom in dark brown, then red is representing oil, then natural gas in blue, then in green, renewable energy. Uh, bioenergy is there in pink. Nuclear is the thin, light blue line above that. So our sources of uh, carbon dioxide emissions and other greenhouse gases, namely coal, oil, and gas, then result in that curve you see on the right, greenhouse gas emissions. As greenhouse gas emissions go up, this leads to temperature change such that by the year 2100, we're expecting to be at around 3.3 degrees in this baseline scenario. So what do I mean by baseline scenario? This is a scenario where we continue on the course that we're on right now. Um, we're taking, we're looking back at some of the historical action that is happening, you know, falling rates of uh, renewable energy prices and that kind of thing, but not saying that there's some, you know, magical new ambition there. That's where we come in to build this scenario and to, and to build from. So um, in Rhodes, what, this is a system dynamics model, but we're pulling from the best available data across a number of different spaces. We're using data from the Energy, International Energy Agency, World Bank, UN, uh, a number of other sources uh, to really uh, make sure this is as rigorous as possible and distills this information in a way that you all as some of you all, very technical, but maybe not everyone here in this room, uh, can use it yourself. It's freely available. You can use it on the internet. OK, the very first thing that was top of mind when you all said, what should we prioritize in terms of action on climate change? Renewable energy. So if I look here on the left, you see this graph. You see that wedge of renewable energy already growing through the end of the century. The good news is, as Ben alluded to, Lots happening in this space. Costs have been coming down now for uh, a couple of decades in a really phenomenal way. That's a good news story when it comes to addressing climate change because, hey, we have this solution here in place. 
but we need more of it and we need it bigger, scaling faster. So what if we made renewables even, uh, even less expensive? We prioritize it even more. So what I'm gonna do is down here on the control panel of En-ROADS, I'm gonna move the slider and watch what happens. Um, and you will see that in real time, I don't know if you've caught that, let me replay that change. In real time, you can see, what if we highly subsidize renewable energy, bringing the cost down? This could mean enabling uh, faster pipelines for development because a lot, in the US right now, a lot of renewable energy projects are stuck uh, because they can't get built, because there are things that stand in their way, rising costs in those ways. Uh, it could just be sheer traditional subsidies. It could look like a lot of things to really incentivize and build this out. Okay, you see here, uh, greenhouse gas emissions come down uh, somewhat slightly, and our global temperature comes down. Now you'll note, maybe this was a surprise to you, maybe not. Uh, it didn't come down a ton. Now what's going on there? Like I said before, we're already counting on so much growth from renewable energy. Continuing to make it cheaper and cheaper uh, helps some, but it isn't like, boom, game changer. We fix climate change with this uh, you know, big, cheaper renewable energy. In some ways, that's a good news story because, hey, it's already happening. Uh, but in other ways, we look at it differently. Um, the next thing that I saw a lot of people prioritizing uh, was electric transportation. Hands, who's got an alternative fuel vehicle, electric, hybrid plug-in electric, something? Yeah, and wow, that's, that's actually a pretty good number, maybe 25% or more of, or of the audience. If I had asked you all this three years ago, I bet that wouldn't have been the case. It's been, you know, a big change recently. Thanks in some part to uh, big legislation like the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States. In other countries, they have also been pushing um, different kinds of electric vehicles hard. China has gone big on electric uh, vehicles. So what does that look like? And um, let me change the graph here. So you can see uh, where we sit today in terms of our electric use. So the electric share of total transport. Here we are. 2024, there's about 4% global transport. Then, this is not just personal vehicles. We're talking about trains, buses, semi trucks, boats, airplanes, the entire transport sector. 4% is electric. In our baseline scenario, that's growing upwards of 50% by the, by the end of the century. That's good. But what if we did it even better? What if we really incentivize electric transport? And also, as we're incentivizing electric transport, making it cheaper, we're also building out massive charging networks because those things go hand in hand. You can't have the uh, electric cars. I was just reading this morning in China, um, there's been some blowback about around electric cars because the charging infrastructure isn't as convenient as it needs to be. So you have to have these things uh, wedded together. So when I move this slider for transport electrification, think to yourself, what is the impact on temperature going to be? Just mentally simulate it. And then I'm going to run the simulator and we'll see. All right, so, and remember the slider here on the, I mean, the graph that I changed it to on the right is electric share of total transport. So you see that goes up to about, Oh, 72% in our highly subsidized, very successful build out of charging infrastructure. The difference that made in terms of global temperature change was another point, point 0.1 degree. Now, some of you might be asking, well, I want to go 100% electric. Now, maybe you were taking notes during the first part of the session because Ben alluded to this, which is that it's very, very hard right now. To, we just have. Some, well, someone mentioned the law of thermodynamics. When it comes to electrifying airplanes and long-range ships, there are some challenges there that we are working on, and there's a lot of cool innovation to help, help that out. But we're not as far along as figuring out how to do electric school buses, which are already on the ground carrying kids to school today. Um, so some of that curve reflects a bit of that, that longer-range uh, possibility. And, um, one of the things that this tool provides 
if I had time, was we could go under the hood, go deeper and say, well, what about different scenarios for electrifying aviation and long range ships? Uh, what does that look like? What if we imagine uh, building out the charging infrastructure even faster? What if it happens slower? Um, and you can play out these different scenarios to, to build it in such a way that it, it really captures your mental model of what the world could be like to see how much impact that could be. If we accelerated that electrification curve much faster, uh, it, you know, we, could, we, could move, we, we could see greater and greater share of total transport. But one of the things to keep in mind, too, is that we don't change over our car fleet, our transport fleet, every year. A lot of cars, they're going to sit in the market 20, 25 years or so. So we have to anticipate you know, when that purchase for a car comes up, when that purchase for other things comes up, is that decision then going to, towards EVs or is it going to something else? And then if that's not going towards an EV, then when is the next opportunity for that consumer to go EV? It might be five, 10 years down the line, or that car gets sold on the secondhand market and continues to be used. So that's where there's different programs out there. There's like this program called Cash for Clunkers, where it'll actually give, give people cash to remove their old, dirty, polluting vehicles off the, off the market so that they're not there. If you just sell, sell it to the next person, who knows how long it's gonna be out there. Really interesting stuff. Um, okay, Ben, do you remember what our third top priority was? Yeah, I think everybody said Bitcoin. I think Bitcoin, they said Bitcoin would solve climate change. <laughs> Bitcoin will not solve climate change, making it much worse. Carbon price. Carbon Thank you price. very much from the front row. Appreciate that. Also, give me a chance to drink some water. Okay. So, third thing carbon price. Ellie. Yes. Before we do carbon price, I want to make sure the audience understands one really important thing. We've just taken two massive actions, which is to dramatically increase the incentivization of renewable energy and to dramatically increase the, relate, the rate of electrifying cars. But as we've done those two things, we've only knocked off two tenths of a degree of temperature rise. We need to go from 3.3, the business as usual case, down to 1.5. And we've only knocked off two tenths of a degree by doing those things. I think a lesson there is that we could add electric cars and add clean energy until the cows come home. But until we're actually using those to replace the sources of greenhouse gases, we're not getting anywhere. The addition itself is not sufficient. It needs to be a substitution for the things that are causing climate change. And it's possible that this, with this next step that we're taking, we might start to learn a little bit about that. This is a great point. And I want to underline it by just changing the, one of the graphs here. So let's look at just how, what energy consumption looks like in this uh, scenario. So we've made, this is this left graph. You can see, actually, surprisingly, it, it doesn't change too dramatically. With renewable energy, we made things cheaper, uh, and we made uh, electric cars cheaper. So we have more things. But as Ben said, when we look at this energy mix, where are those sources of energy coming from? What do you see going on at the bottom? OK, coal in red, oil in, I mean, excuse me, coal in brown, oil in red, gas in blue. They're not growing outstandingly, but they're still there as big behemoths in the energy mix all the way out to 2100. Herein comes the next priority that many of you all voted for. Also, many of you all said it was overhyped, carbon price. So the idea here is that right now, in many uh, sectors of our economy, uh, sources of emission, the industri industries, all, all the different kinds of power plants that release carbon dioxide in the atmosphere can do it for free. Now, what if we put a price on that carbon dioxide and said, hey, 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 uh, the atmosphere is not yours dumping ground, it's a common that we globally hold. Let's say if you're going to pollute it, then you should pay for it. Um, and so we can set a carbon price. Already around the world, if we look at all of the different carbon pricing systems, we're at about $4 per ton of CO2. Here in the US, we've got California system, there's Reggie in the Northeast, British Columbia has their carbon tax, 
China has come on uh, line with some uh, carbon market experimentation. Of course, the EU ETS. Um, some of these systems we've seen over the years fluctuating uh, dramatically in terms of where their pricing levels are at. Um, some systems are working better than others. Um, but what if we had a carbon price that was like big and really significant? And so I'm going to say, let's just start at $100 per ton of CO2, uh, up from the five that we're at now. This roughly, now don't quote me on this, but roughly, think of this as like adding like a dollar to a gallon of gasoline, uh, more or less in terms of equivalent. Now, how that gets passed on to the consumer, lots of questions there, and that's where our policy design uh, people come into play and like, what do we do with the revenue from that? Okay, so there it was, our $100 per ton carbon price. Let me replay that change. Whoa. <laughs> okay, this is where we were. 3.1 degrees, you see greenhouse gas emissions lo somewhat level, um, and then we redo that, and you see greenhouse gases fall, sort of plateau, and namely, look what's happening here. I'll make this even bigger. Um, what's happening here in our energy mix from the year 2020 down to 2040, we see a decline in our coal, our oil, and our gas. So that's really significant. We just dropped global temperature from 3.1 down to 2.6. What's going on here is that we're acting right at the source of emissions quickly. Um, things like our EVs were helpful, but as Ben mentioned, they didn't replace things. They kind of got into the system. There's new, more, and more and more cars. Some people are choosing EVs. Some people are still choosing the other, other types of internal combustion engine vehicles. But when you have a carbon price, you're going right to the heart of, heart of the challenge, which is the CO2 emissions, the tap, the faucet, if we return back to that and if I could just add, analogy. Yeah. When you have a carbon price, you're saying to polluters that they have a choice. They can e either pay for their pollution, or they can innovate and invest their way away from polluting. When you do that, you're creating an incentive. You're creating an incentive that might unleash the entrepreneurial and innovative strengths of the US and of anywhere that you put a carbon price. Because you're giving them a choice and you're telling them, decarbonize in the way that's most efficient and most effective for you. When you get that, you're harnessing everybody's creativity, the power of many businesses. It's an incredibly effective tool to get people to decarbonize on their own terms. It's a little bit of a bummer that we don't have a carbon price in more places. But when people say that a carbon price isn't feasible, it's important to remember that in many areas of, in the world, there is some sort of a carbon price today. And there are signs that that carbon price drives innovation to decarbonize at a very fast pace. Definitely. And, you, and one of the things, too, that we see as well, watch that green wedge there that we were, we were subsidizing it earlier. Renewables, because the fossil fuel sources of fossil fuels are more expensive, then renewables is just that much of a better option in the mix. Now, of course, we have to handle things like the storage challenge with renewables. Um, good thing there's a lot of innovation in that space and a lot of different ideas for short, medium, and long-term uh, storage options such that we can address the challenges around intermittency uh, with renewable energy. And um, we don't have time today, but a layer deeper in inroads, we can look at things like hydrogen and say, okay, how much does that open up our ability to e grow renewables even further than what we have in this scenario? Um, but I want to keep moving on to our different priority areas. And the last two that I remember being pretty significant on the list were deforestation and this technological carbon dioxide removal option. So first, deforestation. Let me change over to talk about um, so, so far, we have subsidized renewable energy, we have a carbon price, and we have electrified transport. This has all been in this energy, sources of energy and energy demand, how we use the energy. This is the mix that we've been addressing, which is really important. It's a big contributor to climate change. But there are other contributors out there, and the land use sector is one that we can't forget. So on this graph here, I'm going to make it really big, greenhouse gas net emissions, by gas. So 
So you see fossil fuel CO2, we've, we've pinched that big gray wedge, it's narrower than it was. Uh, and then we have these other greenhouse gases, F gases, methane, nitrous oxide that we haven't touched so much yet. Um, and then at the bottom, land use carbon dioxide emissions. Land use CO2 emissions largely come from the transition of forest to other types of land use, deforestation. Um, and so one way to address that, of course, and for so many other good reasons, biodiversity loss, uh, rights of people to their own lands, we should stop deforestation. By um, the way, yeah. for those big five we talked about earlier, electric power, transportation, homes and buildings, industry, and agriculture, sometimes when you're doing the carbon accounting, you lump in agriculture with land use. And it's worth noting that globally, a lot of forest land has been cleared to make room for livestock, cow farming. I think we've heard about what's happening in the Amazon. It's happened in many other parts of the world before that. The great irony is that Texas, I don't know if anybody's read the news, but right in our backyard of where we are right now, Texas just had its greatest wildfire, its biggest wildfire that it's ever had. And it lost 10,000 livestock as a result of doing it. So there is some sort of twisted irony in, in the fact that these wildfires that are driven by climate change are killing the livestock that are partially driving climate change. But the point to remember is this deforestation piece is very uh, closely tied to agriculture when we're talking about the global picture. Definitely. Okay, so the graph I've pulled up on the left just to orient us to what we're about to do. Deforestation and mature forest degradation. So when we pull this slider for deforestation, we're doing two things. One, we're stopping uh, the transition, like cutting down forests and then doing something else with them. That doing something else with them, by and large, worldwide, is agriculture. When we cut down trees and transition them to other things, it's because we need more land for cows, more land for soy, these big and you know, agricultural uh, um, entities come in. This is where our food system is so tied up in this question of deforestation in a really significant way. So we're stopping that, but then also the other thing we're doing is addressing mature forest degradation. So this is logging of old growth forests. Mm. So we have all of these big old forests that are huge carbon sinks around the world. And when we log that and turn it into toilet paper, that re results in both a release of carbon from the trees themselves, but also the soils. And it also removes that forest's ability to draw down more carbon. So there's kind of like a triple whammy when it comes to deforestation, particularly too when we're talking about those old growth, mature uh, forests. So when I move this slider, what we're gonna do is we're gonna pull it all off the map. And that doesn't mean that we've killed the timber industry. Let me clarify that. We still are gonna use toilet paper. We're still gonna be using paper and we still need wood to build buildings. Um, it's just that when we do that logging, it needs to happen in those managed forests that are not tapping into our old growth areas. And so doing that in sustainable ways is a huge flourishing industry. And uh, yes, there's, there's work to be done, but there's also a lot of work being done uh, to manage that well. Okay, so deforestation coming down and stopping that mature forest degradation. I'm gonna replay that change again. So we were at 2.6 degrees, now coming down to 2.4 degrees. So two tenths of a degree with our addressing of deforestation and with that, a lot of decisions around land use associated with agriculture and food. Um, then that, this, is, this is getting us close actually, which is great to see. Um, the next thing I wanted to touch on is our carbon dioxide removal. So as I transition there, I wanna show you just where we sit with our CO2 uh, removals from land. So we were removing that, and now uh, those removals are coming down as a result of us stopping deforestation. So then let's go look at our CO2 removals by type. So that's for the, our natural sinks land removals, ocean removals, this is all built into the model and is a key part of our climate system. 
But when we think about technological carbon dioxide removal, what we're thinking about here is those anthropogenic, big word, but our human uh, caused ways of increasing that drain, cleaning out that drain, pouring the Drano in, whatever, whatever it looks like to you in terms of the metaphor. Sources of net CO2 removals area. So I'm going to move this slider for technological carbon removal. And I want to let you all know, this is kind of like a bit of a, a, an aspirational move, because underlying this slider is a whole suite of different technologies that need to scale up to make uh, the big impact that we want to see. And so just to name a few in the mix here, we have direct air carbon capture and storage, otherwise known as DACs. DACs is like these big industrial facilities, some big ones being built here in this state of Texas, uh, like billions of dollars being pumped in by the Department of Energy, uh, big investment flowing in from groups like BlackRock saying, can we remove carbon in a durable way? So can we make sure that when we pull CO2 out of the atmosphere, we can track it, count it, know that it's going to stay underground. And so they're using these big machines that then pump the carbon dioxide into underground reservoirs in ways that we hope are permanently stored. Um, and there's all sorts of monitoring. And yes, there are questions out there, but uh, it's, it's fascinating stuff, um, too. It's very kind of, we're just beginning. This isn't an industry that's at scale yet. So it would need to grow a lot, a lot, a lot. Then um, also under here, we have an approach called enhanced mineralization. So this is this idea that there are certain kinds of rocks um, that we could crush up, rocks that are particularly good at mineralizing carbon dioxide. So they'll react with the air and then store those, that carbon on, in, in the rock uh, molecules themselves. And then we, it could be washed into our ocean and be stored, store the carbon permanently under there uh, through chemistry that is well known. But again, a question of scale and does this, does this ramp up? Uh, there are, there, are, there are, are, are businesses investing in this and exploring what would it look like? We already add different kinds of rocks uh, in agricultural pro rocks is probably not the technical term that farmers would use, but different kinds of additives uh, that help with, with processes that could be, relate to enhanced mineralization. Then there's agricultural soil carbon sequestration. Lots of, uh, I don't know, A-list celebrities are really excited about this stuff right now. There's like the Netflix documentaries about soil. It's cool stuff. We need to be better stewards of our soils and figure out how to store carbon. Um, I have friends who are farmers and they do cool things like rotating where the sheep are in different parts of their farm to make sure that the carbon uh, gets stored and is not uh, released through drying out. Lots of good practices to do there. And then the final um, approach is biochar that we have there. This is this idea of making essentially charcoal um, and then storing it in a way that we're not burning it and that a carbon ending up in the atmosphere. Through a process of pyrolization of your wood, then you store that biochar. This is an ancient technique. We already use biochar. Again, it's an additive that many gardeners add to their soils. But what if we scale it and figure out a way to make sure that that carbon stays in the ground? So as you all probably picked up from um, uh, my description of a lot of these things, it's like we've got these ideas. And the real thing that we sit with right now is how can we go from these ideas, these um, awesome pilot projects that are pretty cool and interesting, to something that is able to pull out gigatons of carbon dioxide in a way that's permanent and actually contribute to this challenge. So, and, I, and by the way, yeah. there are like half a dozen to a dozen new ideas being piloted a year, things that yeah. we haven't even heard of yet or incorporated in the model. That Yeah, that is true. It, 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 is, it, is, a, it is an active space, and you have uh, groups like uh, meta, Stripe, jumping in big and throwing a lot of money into these kind of longer shot ideas to see where does it go. Okay, so we have kind of this relative scale of the max potential of carbon dioxide removal. Um, and I'm just going to move it somewhat here. And you can see, like, okay, 
say we move up to like 30%. I'm going to back off here. And we were at 2.4 degrees and then 2.3 degrees. So that gets us 0.1 degrees. And you see here this stack now of all of these different uh, carbon dioxide removal approaches um, that we just tried that were in that list. And say, OK, what if all of them scale up? This is them being very, very successful. When you talk to the guys that are and, and women who are developing these direct air capture facilities, they're like, yeah, we, we're going for like 100 tons of scale. We're, the scale we're talking at here is gigatons, 10 to the ninth, like big, big scale. So this is a lot of DAX facilities being built. And, and these industries know it. They know that they have to be on these fast ramp up scales. And the question is just, can we do it? Um, and, and if we don't, though, what's the other option? Another way to, to yeah. talk about the scale would be that US total emissions per year are, is just over six gigatons. So this is global carbon capture that's about two thirds of the way to capturing all of US emissions today. It's a ton. It's many tons. It's billions yep. of tons. But we only have a few minutes to solve climate change. And this audience promised they would do it, and they're in a lot of trouble. In fact, the whole world is in a lot of trouble if they don't. Oh, no. All right. So we're at 2.3 degrees. We are short on time. I'm just going to go to you all. Popcorn. What haven't we touched here where you're like, bingo, I've got an idea. I think we need to go here. Yeah, back row. Yell it out. Are clothes the the material in our clothes? Yeah. So great, great idea. I don't have a slider for fashion, but I will say it's built into how much energy we use in tr in particularly in let's call it industry because industry is our manufacturing of goods. So if we make clothes and all of our other consumer goods and products in a way that doesn't require so much energy use, doesn't require, doesn't have oil built into them because they're plastics and polyesters, that would mean that we would have more energy efficiency, we could make, we could be clothed with less amount of energy, that would be a good thing, and a gazillion other things that it would take to improve buildings and industry energy efficiency across the line from the choices we make in which refrigerators we buy to the um, machine processes, processors for furnaces in heavy industrial facilities. There's a whole lot built into this. Energy efficiency. Let's scale it up. Let me change my graphs again and look at our energy mix and our greenhouse gas emissions. And we will move the slider. Let's just move it all the way. 2.2 degrees. That gets us 0.1 degrees. getting close. I saw a hand right over here. Yes. Reduce oil production. So we've already reduced oil production thanks to our carbon price, but let's double down on it because we still see that there's a lot in the mix here. When we think about oil, it's uh, pretty hard to switch it because unless we're electrifying, good thing we're already electrifying. But let's say, what if we just reduce new oil infrastructure? Now you see I'm under in the advanced view and I'm just gonna say, what if we just really ramp down our new oil infrastructure, 2.1 degrees. OK, Whew. we're really squeezing out oil. OK, I saw See another hand of population. What about it? Bring it down. <laughs> all right, you all. OK, population. It's here on, the, on, on here because it's a, it's, an, it's a very important consideration. And when we move this slider, we are not bringing population down. I, I'm not, that's not my business. Uh, what we are saying is we are bringing population growth down within the projections that the UN has set forth. So the UN makes a bunch of population scenarios. They have a low growth scenario and high growth scenario. And they say, oh, what if family planning transitions happen? Population. By the way, there's a lot growth. of great studies that show that uh, uh, sex education and women's empowerment 
are very largely tied to lower population growth scenarios. So globally, that is a major priority, including in the state of Texas, by the way. Excellent. And we have to tread carefully here because there is a dark, dark history and a lot has been documented on that. So I don't want to go without mentioning that. Okay, we're at two degrees. I want to get below two degrees, which uh, I see a hand right there. Take it on home for you. Yes, you in the white shirt. Plant some trees. Okay. Uh, do you all think that planting trees is going to tip, it, tip us over? Just uh, some, oh, I see some pessimists. Some, some optimists? Okay, let's see. That's, that's the fun of a model. Rather than working with our world as a global test case for these kinds of things, this is why we build models, is we can say, well, I don't really love this idea, or I do love this idea. Let's test it. Um, okay, so I'm just going to scale up afforestation, and let's look at the amount of land for growing this amount of trees. So we're, let's just do big scale afforestation. That got us 0.1 degrees. We got below 2 degrees. We need to stay to 1.5. Look at the scale of afforestation. Let me make this bigger. Um, and we are short on time, but this is, a, this is a key point. When we think about planting trees, uh, we tried to kind of contextualize this. That gray dotted line. Think of your world map. India. How big of a space does the country of India take up on your global map? Now I know it has to deal with different projections and which kind of way we're looking at it, but just generally, the area of India, the amount of trees we just planted by moving the slider is two Indias. That's a lot to get the amount of impact that we made. So am I saying don't do it? Maybe, you know, let's think about how much scale we would need to do to make the kind of impact. And of course, one of the big challenges with trees is that in a warming world, they have a habit of catching on fire. Um, so we also have to think about how much we are counting on uh, carbon dioxide removal coming from trees and other net natural sources that are, uh, can then go back up in the atmosphere when climate conditions change, despite our best intentions. Okay, 1.9 degrees. That was, that was a lot. We didn't get to 1.5. You can go home, use this simulator, make the 1.5 scenario of your dreams, share it with the world, but just congratulations on getting this far because it took a lot, and we did it in less than an hour. Hey. <laughs> You've averted a climate disaster. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to... I know we're at the top of the hour. If you've got a jet, you've got a jet. But I want to I I take one moment and 